Lucy's Adventure by Miroslava Yefimava. Setting, hospital in a rural town, morning. At rise, Lucy, 19 years old, is lying in a hospital bed. I thought this was just gonna be a normal and fun camping trip with my dad until I saw the spark in the woods. But not just any spark. The spark was green, or at least I thought so. It was about seven in the morning when I woke up. My dad was still sleeping and me being stupid, I went inside the woods to follow the spark. I was walking deeper and deeper into the woods and closer and closer to the spark. It was getting bigger and bigger. But then it disappeared. Like nothing was ever even there. I just stood in place behind the big blackberry bush in front of me. I could hear my dad calling my name. Lucy, Lucy. I started walking back to where the sun was starting to rise. Only to realize that my dad's voice was getting more and more quiet. So I started to walk the other way. Now starting to run. I was getting scared. My dad told me to never go in the woods alone, especially because we live in Norway, where there's a ton of woods. I ran, and I ran until I reached the river. It was very wide. I think it wouldn't take more than about five minutes to swim across it. I could hear a loud waterfall somewhere above me, probably up on the big hill that was on the right. But then I heard a footstep way behind me. So I assumed it was my dad. I turned around saying, hi, Dad, I'm sorry. I... But it wasn't my dad. It was nothing more than a big black bear. Two of them, standing about nine feet behind me. I gasped. I slowly started to walk away from them and getting down to the river, but they stepped closer. I began to scream as the bears were running towards me. I jumped into the river, frantically trying to get to the other side. I looked behind me, and the bears were both in the river coming after me. I started to cry, knowing I was going to die. I was out of breath, and I haven't even gone half th through the river, and the bears were swimming faster and faster. I was either going to go down or to get ripped to shreds by the bears. Maybe even both. I couldn't feel my legs anymore. I was shaking so bad. But then I reached the other side. I shoved my nails in the dirt to get some grip and I pulled myself up. Without looking back, I ran as fast as I could to the other side of the river woods and jumped inside of a big bush to hide myself. I, could, I turned around, I could still see a little bit of the river and I heard the bear scream very loud. I'm not sure why. I sat in the bush for about 20 minutes and then decided to very carefully get out. I was soaking wet and bleeding everywhere from the scratches. I walked towards the river only, only to see both of the bear's bodies sinking to the bottom of the river. I sat down in the dirt and I just watched as the bears drowned. I was scared. I was full of many emotions. Mostly scared, sad, angry, and disappointed in myself. <sighs> Couldn't believe the mess I got myself in. I laid down in the dirt and I closed my eyes. When I opened them again, there was a white ceiling above my head. I was confused. A voice I'd never heard before yelled, She's awake. Bring the father in. I tried to get up. I really couldn't. It felt like I was laying in bed. I could hear my dad's footsteps running towards me. It sounded like he was crying. Oh my goodness. Lucy, my sweet baby, you're alive. Dad, I'm turning 19 soon. I'm not a baby. Wow. I actually talked. 
my dad got my hand and helped me up. I looked around. I was in a hospital, and the nurse next, neck was next to me. I remember what she told me, that I would be able to go home next week and that I didn't have a big severe damage, just gonna have a cast on my left leg. And I nodded. The nurse, Lily is what her name tag said, handed me a big bowl of vanilla ice cream with two spoons. She said she heard my dad saying it was my favorite. She walked out of the room and I looked over at my dad who was already eating the ice cream. <laughs> His cheeks were full and he looked like a hamster. <laughs> I laughed, realizing it wasn't going to be my last time doing so. The end. Tea with Tia by Obadiah. Characters. Isa is a 20-something Afro-Latina college student. Camila is an Afro-Latina transgender woman. The setting. The time is the present day. A city in San Diego County. Dusk. At rise, Isa is running to Camila's house carrying a sign. She peer, appears to be quite upset. Thea! Thea! Camila comes to the window and opens it. Hola, Isa. What are you doing out so late? The virus is everywhere and there's a curfew because of the African-American man that was killed by the police. Por favor, entra. No, Thea. Because of the virus, I better stay outside. Besides, the air feels muy bueno. Why are you upset? Mommy and Papi. And they just don't get it. How can they just do nothing? Ay, Sobrina, don't be too hard on your parents. They just want to protect you. Loud sirens heard in the distance. My parents don't want me to get involved in the protesting. Well, it's very dangerous and an awful virus. Where's your mask? Isa takes a mask out of her pocket and puts it on. Escucha a tus padres y concentrate on your studies. I am tired of listening to my parents. What was done to George Floyd was so not right. I saw the video, it broke my heart. I'm very angry about what happened. That's why I want to, to join the protesters. Injustice makes my brain want to explode. Take it easy. You're getting yourself all worked up. ¿Quieres algo de té? Sí, por favor. Camila gets up and returns with a tray that has a teapot, two cups, and a container with milk in it. She goes outside from the front door to where there's a table with chairs. Bang, we can sit outside. Eso es muy bueno, six feet apart. Here you go. Cuidado, hace calor. Leche? Si, por favor. Camila pours milk into Yisa's cup. Mm. Tastes so delicious. Dia, you make the best tea. How do you make you so good? It's my secret ingredient. One day, I will tell you what it is. Dia, have, have you ever felt so strongly about something that you just wanted to go out in the streets and protest? See, many years ago, I was around your age. It was 1969. It became known as the Stonewall Riots. The Stonewall Riots? The gay protest? The, uh, you were a part of it? What happened? Well, one night, me and your Aunt Sylvia, we were at the Stonewall Inn in New York, sitting at the bar having a drink, when suddenly there was a commotion the police came bursting in and demanded that everybody leave, but we refused. 
Well, when you refuse, what happened? The police started grabbing and hitting people, and we started fighting back. Were you frightened? Not at the moment. I felt amazingly brave because I know at the time I had to stand up for what was right. I was, and I am, a transgendered woman. Some people credit the Stonewall riots with getting the gay rights movement started. We weren't trying to make history. We just wanted to be treated like everyone else. In some states, being gay was even illegal. That takes a big gulp of her tea. Thank you, Leah. I know what I have to do. Isa puts on her mask and runs off. Hey, you left your sign. And the sign reads, Black Lives Matter. Sounds of My Past by Sarah Siegel. Setting. Early morning, Ernie's granddaughter's home, Carlsbad. At rise, a proud Vietnam veteran, Ernie, in his 70s, sits on a chair facing his teenage granddaughter. He looks out his window, adjusting his swiveling hearing aid. The ringing is a reminder. <laughs> when it makes that sound, it might be a dying battery. But it's also a reminder how I lost my hearing. You know, I was living a good life in Versalia. I was 20 years old, just finished community college and was getting ready to marry grandma. <laughs> I got a letter that September of 65. It was a notice to report for active duty in the military on October 7th. Just a few weeks notice. I wasn't ecstatic when I got, when I received that notice, but I knew it was my job to not argue and to accept it as my calling. So I made it through the training. And on November 30th, 1966, I boarded a troop carrier headed for Vietnam with 5,000 other soldiers. As the ship sailed out of the sailed out on December 1st, and it cruised under the Golden Gate Bridge, we heard the Tony Bennett song. I left my heart in San Francisco. <laughs> do, do you know that song? <laughs> I look back at the United States from the ship, and I felt cold and depressed. About a month later, we made it to the South China Sea. I remember hearing helicopters, bullets being fired, and traces from those rounds and bombs going off like the 4th of July. I got off the ship at Bong Tao with about 150 pounds of gear. I had a bullet vest, two bandoliers with bullets, my rifle, four grenades, a steel helmet, and my duffel bag. I spent my last 10 months in Vietnam with the same 10 men floating on the Mekong Delta and Saigon River. Our job was to protect our soldiers on the land. We used loud artillery day and night. We didn't use, we didn't use earplugs or anything back then. I think about that from time to time. I have no regrets whatsoever. <laughs> I'm happy that I came out of that. 
I've been exposed to Agent Orange. <laughs> and I lost my hearing due to the artillery. <laughs> but I'm happy and enjoy my life, even though I can't hear and sometimes get frustrated. I, I just want to enjoy more life. The two years I spent in Vietnam seemed like an eternity. Looking back at that situation, two years was nothing compared to the lifespan I've had. The end.